Hi, I'm George, and in last week's video, we saw how the two horizon sustainers went through a bit of a bending exercise. Um, and this week, we want to have a look at uh, what happened in more detail. Now, there are really two parts to this. One's the source of heat uh, that causes the epoxy to go soft, and the other's the underlying structure of the actual pressure chamber. So we're going to do a number of experiments uh, that deal with the heat and also look at a number of possible solutions. So let's jump straight into it. So why is heat important? The pressure chamber is made from a composite of carbon fiber and epoxy. The carbon fiber is fine at high temperatures, but if we look at the data sheet for West Systems epoxy, we can see that the glass transition temperature is around 60 degrees Celsius, with onset beginning at about 52. The glass transition temperature is basically when the epoxy starts going from hard to soft. So if we want to keep the epoxy nice and hard, we need to keep it below 52 degrees Celsius. In our case, there are three main sources of heat. The first is ambient temperature in the shade. On a hot day, this can be quite high and for the horizon launch, this was around 30 to 32 degrees Celsius. The second is direct sunlight. The sun can heat things up well above ambient temperature as we'll see in a minute. And lastly, we have compression heating. Basically, when you squeeze air, it gets hot. The faster you compress it, the higher the temperature goes. As the air heats up inside the rocket, this heat is transferred into the walls of the pressure chamber. Let's have a look at how direct sunlight affects the rocket. For comparison, we're also looking at the Dark Shadow rocket because they are similar size and use the same carbon fiber sleeve on the outside. We first measured the surface temperatures of the rocket in the shade, and they were about 25 degrees because we just took them out from the inside of the house. The ambient temperature outside was about 18 degrees. We then took them into the full sunlight and measured their temperature over time. Here you can see that even after 45 seconds, the surface temperature reached 29 degrees on dark shadow, but climbed to 35 degrees on horizon. After three minutes, dark shadow was 35 degrees and horizon was 43 degrees on the red paint and 47 degrees on the black vinyl decals. We can see that the red paint is getting around 10 degrees hotter compared to the yellow paint. We then measured the shady sides of the rockets. Here Dark Shadow was 31 degrees and Horizon was 34 and a half degrees. This means Horizon has at least a 10 degree difference between the shady and sunny sides. We performed this experiment again a couple of weeks later when the ambient temperature was 23 degrees and we could see that the Horizon reached a whopping 56.2 degrees after about 10 minutes in the sun while Dark Shadow was still hovering around 38 degrees at the same time. That is well within the glass transition temperature without any additional internal heating and at an ambient temperature still 8 degrees below what we had at the launch. The white nose cone for comparison remained at around 30 degrees Celsius. So although red looks good on video, it's not an ideal color to use if you want to keep your rocket cool. What is important to note is the temperature difference between the sunny side and the shady side. We suspect this is what happened to Lumpy. Half the rocket was above the glass transition temperature, while the other was below. Another clue confirming this was that it bent away from the sun, implying that the sunny side was softer than the shaded side. Now let's throw in the extra compression heating from the inside. In a separate experiment, we glued a thermocouple inside of a test pressure chamber and connected it to our multimeter to measure the internal temperature as the air is compressed. Here we're filling the pressure chamber with only air. As the pressure increases, we also periodically measure the surface temperature to see what the temperature lag is between the inside and the outside. In this experiment, we only went up to 600 PSI at a similar fill rate to what we saw on the rocket on the day. We found that the temperature went from 12 degrees to 52 degrees. The multimeter actually had a 6 degree offset for this thermocouple, so it should have been 18 to 58 degrees. Here is a graph of the internal and external temperatures as the pressure increased to 600 PSI over a 50 second period. Here is the pressure, this is the internal temperature, and here is the external temperature. So we can see that the compression heating alone can get us easily within the glass transition temperature range. After we stopped pressurizing, 40. the temperature inside the rocket cooled off quite quickly. We also measured the internal temperature drop after we let the air out quite slowly. The temperature dropped to minus 24 degrees Celsius. The softer epoxy itself doesn't cause the rocket to bend. 
It's the result of the internal pressure pushing outwardly on the walls. The softer side will stretch more, causing the whole rocket to bend. Just like this balloon with soft walls, if we blow it up normally, it will stretch lengthways, but it won't bend. If we add a second less stretchy layer to one side and blow it up, then we can see that the more stretchy side will cause the whole balloon to bend towards the less stretchy side. Which now brings us to the second part of the problem. Why did Horizon respond this way and not Dark Shadow that has a very similar construction technique and has flown under the same ambient conditions and pressures but we didn't see any bending? Though it was yellow, the combination of high ambient temperatures and compression heating still could have softened the epoxy. We suspect this has to do with the fibre orientation in the pressure chamber walls. So why is fibre orientation important? Composite pressure chambers have an ideal winding angle of plus or minus 55 degrees for maximum pressure containment. Because we don't have a winding machine, we use carbon fibre sleeves as the next best thing. We select the sleeve size carefully for a particular rocket diameter so that when it's stretched onto the mandrel, the fibres in the sleeve are as close to 55 degrees as possible. Here is a number of examples where we measured the different size sleeves for the same diameter. Dark Shadow uses exactly the same external sleeve as Horizon. However, Dark Shadow's inner liner was designed mostly as an airtight bladder and to give the rocket its shape. It wasn't intended to provide much pressure containment. Its inner liner is made from several wraps of plain weave fiberglass cloth whose fibres are oriented 0 and 90 degrees. Because Horizon was designed for higher pressures, we decided to make the inner liner out of the same sleeve with its fibres also at plus or minus 55 degrees. Now if we look at the stresses in a pipe that wants to bend, one side will be under compression and the other side will be under tension. To try to resist this bending, you need fibres in line with the stress direction, which means along the length of the rocket. Dark Shadow provides these fibres on the inner liner, while Horizon has no fibres oriented in this way, either on its inner liner or on its outer sleeve. Because of this, the rocket is more susceptible to bending. So there you go, the combination of the different heat sources with the sun softening one side more than the other, and the fibre orientation was why the rocket failed in this way. Now why didn't we see this in Horizon's earlier pressure tests? Well, with hydrostatic tests, the rocket is full of water, keeping it all nice and cool, regardless of the ambient temperature, sun or compression heating. Now that we've learnt an important lesson, what can we do to fix it? There are a number of options. Reduce heating by filling slower, provide some shade and change the colour of the paint. Number two, use a different epoxy with a higher glass transition temperature. Number three, change the construction technique of the rocket. Number four, provide extra cooling inside or outside of the rocket. While we were at the launch site, we really only had two of those options to try. Fill the rocket slowly, which was easy enough to do, and provide some way of cooling it. A day earlier, we met up with Cran from its rocket science adventures, who brought his water rockets to the event for kids to fly. He and Sarah do all kinds of events. If you want to know more about what they do or buy some of their supplies, please visit his website in the description below. We asked if he could help us with an experiment using his setup as he launches rockets with a full bore nozzles that give maximum acceleration, which he was happy to do. For cooling the rocket, what we really needed was some kind of thermal protection, or TP for short. Thankfully, there was a source of toilet paper at the launch site, and so we went about obtaining some. The idea was to put the strip of toilet paper onto the rocket and wet it down. The wet toilet paper would stick by itself to the rocket, and evaporative cooling would do its job in the breeze. The toilet paper would stay in place until the rocket was launched, and then acceleration and air drag would automatically pull it off. We then launched the rocket, and sure enough, all the toilet paper was ripped off. This is not all that different to what the Indian Space Agency do on their PSLV rockets, where thermal insulation falls off during launch. After landing, we carefully inspected the rocket to see how much toilet paper remained on the rocket and especially on the leading edges of the fins. Any accumulation of toilet paper would have drag implications. We found that there was only a tiny amount of toilet paper that was left. Pretty much everything else was shredded. We repeated the experiment a couple of times just to make sure we got consistent results. With these tests successfully performed, we wanted to take it up to the next level. We had our light shadow rocket along with us and what do you know, it was also red. 
So we decided to do a full length toilet paper experiment to see how much of it would come off during launch. Here we're setting up the rocket for launch. The paper is very fragile when it's wet. After we set the rocket up on the launcher, we had to hold for a while until the range cleared and so the rocket sat there for about 15 minutes. In that time the paper had mostly dried out, so we had to re-wet it again. But at least we now know how long the wet toilet paper will last. The rocket was then pressurized and launched. Go. <laughs> it I thought it's gonna go a lot higher. Nah, not this one. Not this one. This rocket had lower acceleration than the smaller rockets we tested earlier, and we could see that the paper ripped off later into the flight. And here is the launch again from a different perspective. When it landed, we again saw small pieces of toilet paper still stuck to the rocket, but pretty much the bulk of it came off easily. Realistically, we probably wouldn't rely on this cooling method for future launches, but it was still a fun experiment to try. And you never know when you might need this technique in the future. Heads up, heads up. And with that flight, it was time to pack up and head back to Sydney. Please share your thoughts and suggestions in the comments below. So that's our best guess as to what actually happened. Our solution now is to build a new sustainer with the inner liner made out of fibers that run uh, along the length and horizontally. Uh, we're also going to paint the rocket white and we're going to fill the rocket a bit slower than last time. So hopefully all of those together should solve this bending problem. We're already underway with the construction of the new sustainer. This time it's a lot faster because we already have all of the processes in place, all of the jigs are done, and we don't have to build the deployment mechanism. So we hope to get this finished and launch it by the end of September. In the next video, we'll show you the full progress of this rebuild, and we're also going to have a look at what's going to happen to Lumpy and Sandy. There's still some hope for them yet. Anyway, that's all for this week. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Oh. I was holding it the wrong way. Okay.